Okay, today we're going to talk about growing garlic in Kentucky. Uh, it's really not that hard, but we're going to do some background information just to give you an idea about uh, where garlic comes from and, and it's kind of its history and a little bit of that. And then we'll talk about uh, varieties and then actually how to grow it and plant it and uh, fertilize and all those kinds of things. First off, uh, as far as the plant goes, garlic is Allium sativum. It is in the onion or the lily family. It is a root crop, which means that we, uh, the bulb grows underground. It's in the family Aliaceae, which is the, the, uh, the onions, <coughs> excuse me, is among the oldest of all cultivated plants. In fact, the species name sativum actually means cultivated. So it was cultivated way back uh, thousands of years ago and used for a, a food product. Uh, the leaves are long and narrow and flat like grass, as you can see there in that picture. Uh, and it's also a member of, the, as I just mentioned, the same group of plants as the onion, the chive, the leek. Uh, matter of fact, there is even a member of the leek family that we actually use as garlic, and we'll talk about that here uh, later on in the PowerPoint. First off, as far as the flower goes, uh, the flowers are placed at the end of the stalk, as you can see there in the picture. Uh, they, they rise directly above, uh, above the bulb. They're grouped together in a, a globular head, or it's also, uh, botanically speaking, an umbel. Um, some of you all that are master gardeners, you're going to learn that in botany. Uh, with an enclosing leaf-like structure, you can see there's called a spathe, which just covers that and protects those. And among there, you can also have small bulbules, which depends on variety. Some of them will actually uh, go ahead and flower. Some will actually go ahead and produce just little bulbules. Or you'll get a mix of both there at the end of that flower stalk. Uh, the garlic flowers, they are pretty. Um, they're rarely picked as ornament because of their strong odor. It's not something you really want to take in the house, but there's another reason we would pick these, and we'll talk about those in just a minute, but we never let them get to the flower stage. Uh, the young flowers also, this is the reason we don't get them to the flower stage, is they can be sauteed for a mild garlic flavor. If anyone's not uh, try, tried the, uh, the, the garlic flowers, you need to pick those. You can see them, they just start to curve in that picture. That's when you would clip those and you would saute, saute those in a little butter and uh, salt and pepper in, a, in a, a, a saute pan and you could eat them just like that. It's a very mild flavor. They're, they're really, really uh, tasty actually. So the actual bulb is um, again, Allium sativum. It generally is in the same portion of the plant that is eaten. That's the only portion other than the flowers. Uh, it is compound, which means that the actual entire bulb actually contains a separate cloves or bulbules, which are just smaller versions of the uh, uh, garlic, the main bulb. That's what we actually plant. Uh, and they're grouped together between the, the little membranous scales there that actually protect the actual flesh of uh, the bulbule itself. So a little history. Um, they are, uh, garlic originated from Central Asia um, and it's been used for spices and foods, folklores, medicines for over 5,000 years. So this plant has been with humans for a very long time. Um, it is one of the most widely researched medicinal plants. Through trade, garlic spread in popularity throughout Asia and eventually to Egypt and Europe. And then in, during the age of exploration, um, it helped to propagate the use of garlic to other parts of the world, which ended up all over the world. Every culture now eats garlic in some form or fashion. Today, somewhere between 300 and 400 varieties of garlic are cultivated worldwide. And in the United States, uh, over 250 million pounds of garlic is consumed each year. So that is a lot of garlic for uh, a population of 300 and, and some million people. A little history here as far as medicinal, uh, medicinal use goes. In traditional Chinese medicine, uh, Islamic medicine and folklore medicines, uh, several spices and herbs, including garlic, are described to possess medicinal purposes. Uh, in China, for instance, garlic tea has long uh, was recommended for uh, fever, headache, and, and cholera. And then in rural Japan, miso soups containing garlics uh, is used as a remedy for the common cold and headache, fever, and sore throat, kind of like we use our chicken soup in, in Europe. They used more of a miso and garlic soup uh, there. And then in the Egyptian Medical Codex, uh, in the papyri papyrus, easy for me to say, dating to about 1550 BC, includes about 22 therapeutic formulations that actually mention garlic as an effective remedy for a variety of ailments, including heart problems, headaches, bites, worms, and tumors, you name it, that there's some use for it there. And Escortes uh, wrote of garlic's ability to clear the arteries. That dates all the way back to the first century AD. Uh, if you've looked at some of the newer medicines and some of the over-counter uh, uh, health medications these days that are, help our bodies, garlic is involved in a lot of these. So these people were not on the wrong track. 
Uh, it is reported that in ancient Egypt, the workers who had to build the Great Pyramids were fed their daily share of garlic as a form of a health, healthy prolongation, I guess, where they could work all day and keep uh, working, maybe help keep from getting some infections and things. And then from the Roman antiquity through World War I, uh, garlic post poultices were used to prevent wound infections. And there actually research has shown that garlic it does have antibacterial properties. So they know this uh, a long ago and, and we've even used it some in modern medicines today. And then if you wanna fast forward a little bit, in the early 18, uh, in early 1853, the famous microbiologist, uh, Louis Pasteur, you've heard of pasteurization. He's the one who invented that. that. He performed several original works uh, showing that garlic could actually kill bacteria. And then in 1916, the British government issued uh, a general plea for the public uh, to supply it with garlic in order to meet some wartime needs. So you're looking at 1916, that's pre-antibiotics. So there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, things, uh, uh, other uses that they, they could to get rid of uh, bacteria at that time. And then garlic was called uh, the Russian penicillin in World War II because after running out of antibiotics, the Russian government actually turned to the ancient treatments for its soldiers to try to uh, uh, limit some infections there. And then after World War II, uh, some pharmaceutical companies uh, manufactured garlic compounds, what we use today uh, for intestinal spasms. Uh, Van Patten Company produced another one for lowering blood pressure. There's several forms you've heard of the uh, over-the-counter uh, health uh, medicines like garlic. There's one today for, uh, I heard on TV the day was for high blood pressure and there's uh, several other ones out there for stomach ailments and things. So there is some evidence that uh, medicinally this garlic is very healthy for us. So on into actually how to grow garlic. There are two types of garlic. Uh, there is the soft neck, which you can actually braid because they you generally, and I shouldn't say they shouldn't, they generally do not produce that flower stalk that uh, I mentioned earlier as far as that you can saute, uh, but they can. And then we have the hard neck, which are, you see in that bottom picture there, uh, they produce a very long, hard stalk that can't be braided or is very hard to braid. So most people just bound those together and hang those up in a bundle, as you can see there, to dry. Um, whichever one, the, depending on varieties, um, most people, unless they're a really uh, big garlic connoisseur, won't notice the difference in the subtle flavors of these. But we'll talk about some varieties and, and how they're supposed to, uh, kind of how their flavors will change based on, on their uses. So first off, we're gonna talk about the hard neck uh, types. Again, those are the ones you can't braid. They produce a flower stalk or a scape, which is often called bolting, which is going to flower. Um, we say bolting when we're talking about lettuces and some other plants. Uh, the same difference with, with talking about the garlic or the onions. Um, the flowers, if they're produced, they're usually a, a, a bort and form a bulbule instead of an actual open flower, but you may see both on the same head there if you go ahead and let those flower. Uh, generally speaking, we don't want to, them to go ahead and let them produce little bulbules because they take three seasons or so to produce a good bulb size. So it's better just to clip those out when you see those or to let them grow a little bit like in the earlier picture and then uh, when they're uh, immature, go ahead and clip those off and saute those and eat those. And that way you'll still have uh, most of the energy going back into making the actual larger bulb with uh, multiple bulbules in it or cloves. So the bulbs uh, typically consist of four to 12 uh, cloves around a flower stalk. That can be way more than that or way less, depends on the variety. Some of them produce larger cloves and less number of them. Some of them produce a lot smaller cloves, but they may have 20 and 30 in, in the bulb. It's, that's a variable thing. Um, again, these hard necks are difficult and impossible to braid. Uh, some of the hard necks do not store as well as soft necks. So that's something you may want to keep in mind if you want to store these a long time. But generally speaking, for us, and we'll talk about how, when to, when to harvest and when, when to plant, Generally speaking, they'll keep just fine for us to have some to replant each year. Uh, if you see the picture in there, you can see the little scape at the top, the little curly cue. Most of them will curl over over time if you let them grow a little bit. And that's usually whenever you start to see that curl is when you clip that out and then you can saute that and eat that and keep that plant from producing or putting energy into that, that flower or those bulbules at the top. And then you see the, the label there with the little strap like leaves and then you'll see the bulb, which is the garlic bulb there at the bottom. Uh, some hardneck varieties include Rocumble, uh, Purple Stripe, and we're going to go through these, so I'm not going to read all these right now, but we're going to go through these individually here in just a minute. So the softneck versions, they do not produce a flower stalk. Again, they produce just the, uh, I shouldn't say they don't, so most of the times they don't, depending on the weather. Um, they can be braided when it's dried down. Um, this is usually the ones that you see 
uh, that are used for mass production because they tend to keep a little longer um, and they are grown in warmer climates. This one is not suited for a cold climates. Uh, the great thing about being here in the middle in Kentucky, we can grow the hard necks or the soft necks. Um, generally, for the most part, hard necks probably do a little bit better, but either one can grow, be grown just fine here in Kentucky. And then uh, the hard necks are usually a little more productive for us. Uh, so um, it's whatever you like, as long as you don't let that energy go into producing that flower stalk. The soft necks, uh, they can consist of 10 to 40 cloves uh, in, in each bowl. They'll be arranged in multiple layers like an artichoke. Uh, we'll show you a picture here in just a minute. And generally they have much longer shelf life than the hard necks. A couple of the varieties are, the, are, are actually artichoke and silver skin. We'll talk about these just in a minute. Uh, usually if you're buying fresh garlic from the grocery store, you're gonna get a soft neck. So a few varieties, we have the Rocombo type, um, these are moderately sized plants, only three to four feet tall, or three to four feet tall. We'll talk about a few varieties that are shorter and taller. Um, and then they'll be two to three times, uh, the scape is, can coil two or three times before straightening out. So when they're in that coil, again, is whenever you wanna cut those. Um, the bulbs here are off white, and they will have a little purple streak here and there, which is great. We'll talk about some other varieties in just a minute that have more purple. Um, and they'll store about four to five months. Obviously, if you put these in the crisper in the refrigerator, they're gonna keep more towards the five or six months. Um, they are prone to double clove, which means nothing to me and you because we're gonna eat either one, but for commercial production, that's a no-no because basically, instead of having one bulb there, one nice big uh, garlic bulb, it'll split and you'll have two. Sometimes you'll see onions do the same thing. Uh, a few varieties here uh, for this is German red and recumble usually is, uh, they're more of a Spanish, or not Spanish, more of a European uh, varieties. So you can see the, by the names there, it kind of tells you that with German red, German brown, Spanish roa, um, Russian red. There isn't like Killarney red and Montana giant. You'll see some of those uh, if you buy garlic online. A lot of these uh, places are out west that sell uh, garlic online for you to, or seed garlic for you to buy and plant in your garden. Then we have purple stripe. Some people really like these varieties that have color to them, uh, which they are kind of pretty. Um, this, this one is a moderately sized plant. It can get three to five feet tall with the scape uncurled. Um, and they'll uh, only usually do a three quarters of a turn, so they're not as curly as the recumble type. Uh, this one has numerous, uh, the bulbules are, are numerous and generally a purple color, you can see there. Um, the clove skins are also brownish. So some people may look at this and think maybe they may be going bad, but they're not, they just find that color is built into these. And these store quite well, five to seven months for these varieties here. And they'll just have about eight to 12 cloves uh, in, a, in a bulb. And you'll also see here on some of these varieties that we've, they've put in, how many cloves is in a pound. And that kind of gives you an idea of how much bigger or smaller the cloves are in those varieties. So you, you'll get about 60 on this one. You'll see some in a minute that it may only get 30. So you just tells you the cloves are bigger. Uh, and again, some people like bigger cloves of garlic, some people like smaller. This is all up to your personal preference and how you like to cook with, with garlic. Uh, a couple of varieties here. Um, one thing also about the purple stripe uh, types, a lot of times uh, they are the more, uh, I shouldn't say truer garlic, but their genetic material is closer to the varieties that were grown a thousand years, 2000 years ago. They've done some DNA testing on these and these purple types are closer to the, the more ancient types. Uh, a couple of varieties here with the purple stripe is Chesnock Red and Persian Star. Next, we have the glazed purple stripe, uh, which is similar to purple stripe, except the clove, clove, the clove color is not quite uh, as intensely purple. This one also, one pound of garlic supplies about 60 cloves. Uh, so uh, this is, I would consider this a medium sized uh, garlic clove. Uh, also the uh, scape tends to form a full coil before straightening out. And a couple of varieties in here are purple glazer and red resin. If anybody's ever ordered garlic from, uh, seed garlic from some of the, uh, the places that sell seed garlic, uh, the nurseries and things, these varieties are all pretty common depending on which nurseries you're with. So these, these varieties will grow pretty much either, uh, depending on your climate, uh, you know, the, the uh, soft necks grow better in a warmer climate generally and the hard necks in a colder. So wherever you're buying these from, you may have more or uh, less of a variety but all these are pretty common as far as seed garlic goes. Then we have the pur uh, marbled purple stripe, uh, which the bulbs actually look more like the recumble types, the European versions. 
than the purple stripes, but genetically they've analyzed, uh, analyzed these and they're cl closer to the purple stripe uh, uh, forms. This one has a typical bulb, has about four to seven cloves and uh, one pound is about 50 cloves. So it's a little bit bigger than the other purple stripe varieties. And a couple of varieties in this group is Siberian, uh, Brown Tempest and Cresnata Red. Couple, another uh, variety has porcelain. Uh, this is a large, vigorous plant. These get four to six feet tall uh, when the escape is uncurled. And if you think about that, that's a pretty tall uh, uh, garlic plant. Uh, these have a, a loose and somewhat random coil to their, to their actual uh, bloom stalk. And the bulbules are also quite a few of the bulbules. Uh, the bulbs are large and typically contain about four to six cloves. So these are gonna be large fat cloves of garlic. So if you like to cook with a lot of garlic, this one's a good one. Uh, you won't have to be peeling a lot of uh, separate cloves this way. Uh, they tend to be more difficult to peel though than the recombo, so keep that in mind. If you don't like peeling garlic, maybe it's not one that you would want to grow. Uh, and double cloves are rare, uh, which is really good if you wanted to be in the commercial production in which you'll uh, see a lot of these varieties in commercial production. Um, and this one has about 35 cloves per pound. So it gives you an idea of how big those cloves are compared to some of those purple stripe variety. So they're almost twice as big uh, if you look at it as far as what it takes to make a pound. Uh, a few varieties here. We have the Romanian Red, the Georgian Crystal, um, Music, and all these are pretty common. German White, Georgian Fire is one I would tell you that is a little spicier, a little hotter uh, garlic flavor than some other ones. So if you're into that, that may be one you'd want to try. Some people like more of a subtle garlic flavor. And it's, all these are per, uh, personal preferences. Then we have artichoke. Uh, this is a, usually a soft neck, but uh, one thing they've found out that when you grow some of these soft necks in a little bit cooler climate where it gets colder, like even here, then some of these can actually bolt or go, go uh, produce a, a, uh, a scape. So in a milder winter, you may only get one or 2% to bolt, but if we have a cold winter without snow cover, you may get 70 to 100% to bolt. Doesn't hurt the plant. You would just go ahead and you would cut that scape out just like you would in the other, uh, varieties that way. Uh, the bulb color is usually whitish to purple blush uh, and the bulbers typically contain 12 to 20 cloves per, per uh, uh, one pound of bulbs. I just said that wrong. A bulb usually has 12 to 20 cloves and you can see it takes 80 cloves to make a pound. So these are really smaller cloves of garlic. So it, it, again, personal preference. If you don't like a lot of garlic in the dish, you may want to pick one of these that has a smaller clove. Uh, uh, and Nick, I'm not sure how to say this word, but Nickelium is one that's pretty common. You see California early, you see a lot. Susanville is another very uh, uh, common one. I've grown Susanville and Nickelium. I'm not sure how you say that in Nickelium, uh, but uh, those are all good varieties and they all do quite well here. Then we have the Asiatic, which is a shorter garlic plant, only gets about three feet tall with the scape. So it's a shorter one. So if you want something shorter, uh, depending on where you need to grow it, this one may be a good choice for you. Um, and then this one, a flower stalk almost always forms under cold conditions. So in our typical winter, they probably would form uh, a flower stalk. Uh, and there's usually about four to eight large cloves per bulb and uh, one pound of bulbs uh, will provide about 50 cloves. So that's 50 cloves to make a pound. That's, that's probably in the middle of some of these uh, ranges on these. And this one can be stored up to seven months, which is really good too. Uh, a couple of varieties here, we have Asian, Asian Tempest and Japanese, uh, and you can see a couple of other Asian varieties there in, with that, the, the Asian names, which is harder for a country boy like me to say. <laughs> uh, then we have Turban. Um, this one's genetically related to the soft neck types, but often does form a flower stalk under cold conditions. Again, depending on the summers we had or the winters we have. So last winter, we probably would have had less uh, bolting on these. But uh, if we have one of those polar vortexes come in with no snow cover, you're probably gonna get a lot of bolting, which for us as homeowners or as gardeners, and we're gonna eat these ourselves, we don't really care. But some people that grow these commercially may, may, may uh, care about uh, if they produce a flower stalk or not. Uh, this one is about seven to 11 cloves per bulb and about uh, 60 cloves per pound because these are a little bit smaller. Uh, the cloves are brownish and the bulb color is usually dark. Um, and then the skins are loose, making it easy to peel. So if you're one that hates peeling garlic, this is probably a good, pretty good choice for you. Um, and then this one only lasts about three to five months. So it's when you may have to take care to get those cloves to last so you can plant them back if you're gonna replant your own uh, garlic each year. A couple of varieties there, we have Red Janus, we have Blossom, Chinese Stripe. 
And then we have Creo, which is actually genetically related to the soft neck types, but often forms a flower stalk under cold conditions. We I mean, that's 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 running through these that sometimes they don't produce flower stalks, sometimes they do, but usually if they have a cold winter, uh, they do. Uh, this one is uh, about eight to 12 cloves per bulb, but it takes 80 cloves to make a pound. So this one's got very small cloves. Uh, so if you're one of those people that like a lot of garlic, this one may not be the one for you. Um, but usually um, this dark purple clove is really pretty. It's really pretty sitting on the counter. Uh, and, you know, believe it or not, people are into, you know, just the looks of things. Uh, and if they're nice and, and pretty. This one has a very good flavor too, and it's kind of a sweeter, milder flavor. So if you're putting this in a dish with raw, that needs raw garlic, this is a good choice. Um, and you can see there, this one stores quite well, six to eight months. So that's that's a, a, also a plus for this variety, these varieties. So we have Ajo Rojo, uh, Burgundy, and then Creole Red here, as far as varieties go. And then uh, we have Silver Skin, which is a true soft neck type, even under uh, cold conditions. Um, the lack of flower stock makes this garlic pipe the best for braiding. This is the one that you're going to see a lot in commercial sales, this, this uh, silver skin varieties. Um, the bulbs usually is small, usually less than two inches. And under cold conditions, especially after a cold open winter, they're going to be smaller, which sometimes is uh, not good for, for our Kentucky winters. You can, can get quite some, some quite small garlic out of these. Uh, but the clove skins are somewhat tight, making peeling difficult, which is also not good, but also that protects that garlic where it doesn't get as bruised as easy, and that can cut down on, on some uh, rot problems as well. So you, you can kind of take the good with the bad with these. But some typical varieties here, we have Silver White, uh, uh, Nucata Red, Mild French, s &H Silver, and Idaho Silver. Silver White and s &H Silver, you're going to see a lot of those as, sold um, as seed garlic from uh, some of the garlic companies. And then I uh, talked earlier about a, a plant that we use for garlic that's not actually garlic. It's actually a leek. This is elephant garlic, which produces huge uh, bulbs and huge cloves. Um, it can grow much larger than true garlic with each bulb about five or six cloves weighing as much as one pound. Uh, the taste of elephant garlic is very mild. It's a very mild garlic flavor. This grows quite well in Kentucky as well. and We can get some nice large uh, bulbs off of this and large cloves off of these. Personally, I like the flavor of the elephant garlic because it's mild, uh, especially if you roast that whole clove or whole bulb, squeeze the flesh out and rub it on a piece of toast with some butter on it. This, uh, I think elephant garlic is probably the best for that uh, compared to any of the other gar actual garlics. So now we're going to culture. Uh, garlic grows best in full sun in a well-drained soil with high organic matter, which you would expect like onions, even prefer those as well. Loam soils are best. Uh, most of us around these parts have a lot of clay in our soils. So if you can add some organic matter, that'd be great. Um, drought or excessively wet conditions will reduce your yields. Um, we have more of a trouble with excessively wet conditions than uh, drought on garlic because of the time frame that we're going to grow these, which we're going to talk about that. Um, so to improve your soil properties, you need to till in. A, if, if you have time, if you're going to plant it this year, obviously you're going to have to do some other things. But if you know a year ahead that you're going to grow garlic, then you can improve your soil properties by turning under a green manure crop a few weeks before planting, which can be um, anything from uh, oats to wheat, rye, uh, veg, clover, myriad of things that you could turn under. Uh, a well-composted manure will add organic matter. If you want to go ahead and add that now, if you've got composted manure, if you know you're going to plant this fall, that'd be great uh, a thing to go ahead and till that in now. Um, it'll also improve uh, your tilth, which is loosen your soil up, which will help allow that garlic bulb to get a little bigger than it might if it was growing hard clay. Uh, your optimum pH is around six to seven, um, like most of our food crops. And I, you know, I know there's people listening all over the state, but here in central Kentucky, our average uh, native pH is around six to six four. So generally speaking, our native pH is pretty, pretty good for, for uh, garlic. But I know depending on what parts of the states you are, there may be a lot more acidic or a lot more alkaline than that. As always, get a soil test. You'll hear that from an extension agent every time or a horde agent, an ag agent. Uh, get a soil test. It's an easy peasy way to know exactly what you need to apply to grow uh, any crop that you're growing, where it be garlic or onions or, or vegetable crops or flower crops, whatever. Just get a soil test. Uh, it, it's free in some counties and in counties that charge, it's very minimum, it's usually anywhere from six to seven dollars. So it's very worth 
going ahead and investing in that soil test uh, to know exactly what much fertilizer, lime, whatever you might need, um, that you'll know exactly what to apply so you're, you know, you're going to grow the best garlic that you can grow. Uh, garlic has a moderate to high demand for nitrogen, so that's something we need to keep an eye on because uh, nitrogen is going to help this plant grow more leaves, which is going to help it grow larger uh, bulbs. So you need to apply about eight pounds of urea in March for every thousand square feet of bed. Uh, if your soil test indicates nothing else is needed or you can apply, if you don't want to do a soil test, 28 pounds of triple 10 per 1,000 square feet. Uh, again, I would recommend going ahead and getting the soil test, but I know some people, maybe time is a factor in this and you don't have time or, um, anyway, if, if you know what, what your soil test is, you would apply what the soil test said and then you may apply the urea. You're gonna to have to apply the urea separately anyway because uh, as you know, nitrogen comes and goes and we have to apply that each season. So uh, garlic is also relatively non-demanding with regards to fertilizer. Um, once it's planted, once you've met its needs, it's gonna be quite fine. So again, once you balance your soil out, uh, nutrients based on your soil test, you'll know that your, your garlic is gonna be good to go. As far as planting, fall planting will give you the best results, I know. Uh, many of you probably, or, or, or those of you that said you didn't have good luck with garlic, was probably because you bought garlic cloves in the spring and you plant them in the spring, and that is just not a good yielder for us. Um, you're going to lower yield, a lower or smaller uh, bulb. It's just not the best uh, uh, garlic you can grow in Kentucky. So we're going to do, we're going to plant in the fall. Uh, seed garlic is generally purchased from dealers. However, even 15 to 20 percent of commercial growers save their own seed. Um, as a homeowner, I would probably save my own seed garlic um, most years. If something happens, maybe I need a different variety or something, may buy it. Seed garlic is not cheap usually. Uh, so a lot of uh, groups, especially uh, people that sell at farmer's markets and places like that, they're going to keep their own seed garlic each year and plant their own uh, stock back. Um, it's very easy for uh, homeowners to save theirs uh, as well. And then you can plant back and you won't have to have the expense of uh, buying that seed garlic each year. For best results, you want to plant your garlic in rows 30 inches apart with six inches between the bulbs. As you can see there, they've laid these out before they've planted them. Uh, this can be done in wide rows as well. You can do them in single rows. Uh, more spacing generally gives you a larger bulb, uh, obviously to a limit there. You don't want them too far spaced out, but pretty much to get a large bulb size and to fit as much as you can in there, that 30 inches apart with six inches between the bulbs is gonna pretty much give you your, your, uh, your best yield on garlic. It's gonna give you a nice bulb size and it's also gonna allow you to grow more garlic in a smaller space. So just keep that in mind. Don't overcrowd it though, because you'll get a small bulb back and uh, that's just uh, not what we're looking for here. So as far as planting, you wanna plant your cloves, not bulbs. Again, you wanna plant the, the little cloves that you're breaking out of that bulb each clove will yield a bulb with multiple cloves. Uh, one thing you do want to make sure you plant these right side up. I know a lot of crops, it doesn't really matter. Potatoes will come up no matter which way you turn them, those. And these will come up too. But you can see that in those pictures, if you plant them the wrong way, the garlic knows which way is up, but then you're going to have that crook in the, um, the uh, stem there where your roots actually above or above where the stem is coming out. Or you can also increase the amount of double cloves you've got there. And you can see that which as a homeowner, double cloves doesn't hurt, hurt us much. It's gonna give us smaller clo cloves, but we can still use that. Commercial people can't sell that. So if you look at the clove there, uh, there's a little arrow there pointing at the end down. So the little fat end goes down in the ground, the pointy end goes up. So mulching is always a good idea with garlic. You wanna apply mulch in the fall after planting. This is gonna, uh, the be it's best to wait until we have uh, a few good freezes, usually around Thanksgiving. Um, one thing that this does help, it keeps those cool season weeds out of your garlic, which can get pretty rampant uh, during the winter and spring. So if you have a good thick layer of mulch, that uh, garlic's gonna come right up through that, but then you don't have to worry about the, the hen bit and chickweed and all those other cool season weeds. Um, be sure you do use uh, clean straw. If you use straw, um, there's a couple things there. You don't want to try to have to pull uh, straw seedlings out of that. So you want something that's been, uh, that doesn't have seeds in it anymore. Um, also, you want to use something that doesn't have a lot of weed seeds in it either. 
Um, and another thing on the wheat, sometimes we've had in a few years back that some wheat that people used had had some herbicide put on it back when they were growing it for, for uh, uh, grain production. And some of that uh, herbicide actually came through and killed a few plants. So it's usually uh, I like to ask what the wheat was grown for. If it was grown for uh, just a cover crop, then you know that it likely never had a herbicide put on it. Uh, you can also use bark mulches if you would like. Um, you could use uh, uh, grass clippings, leaves, whatever you want to use. Any kind of organic material works really great uh, as a mulch for these. Now, it'll keep your weeds down. It insulates your soil, which will keep the temperature even for your garlic. It'll also reduce heaving, where some of these might even push out of the ground if you have a lot of freezing and thawing. Also, it's going to conserve moisture. Next um, spring and summer, we have a cool uh, or a dry spell that, uh, that's going to conserve moisture. Uh, so those are just all good ideas to, for mulching. The biggest thing is if you do let them get weeded, it's gonna reduce your bulb size. So that's a, a big no-no for us that's growing, wanting to grow a really nice garlic. Uh, irrigation, um, it generally doesn't need to be irrigated in Kentucky, neither for homeowner or commercial production. So um, we're planting these in the fall, which when we usually get uh, rain, uh, you know, from if we planted these in the 1st of October, which is late September, 1st of October is a good time. We usually get rain by the first of sept or November at least, uh, and then it stays wet from on through time to harvest that. So irrigation is not really a factor for us uh, here in Kentucky. As far as escapes go, we talk, I talked about this multiple times already, but the hardneck varieties generally produce escapes, um, and then you need to make a decision. You either let the escape form, uh, which will can uh, reduce your bulb size, but you get to eat them, or as soon as you start to see that little scape come out, then you'll go ahead and pinch it out. Personally, I like to let them grow out a little bit just to start that little curl and then clip them out and eat them. That way it doesn't reduce your yield that much, but um, you get kind of a, a two harvest that way. You get a, a nice uh, late spring harvest of the scapes that you can saute, and then you also get the nice cloves later. So a few problems you might have, garlic is relatively easy to grow crop, uh, crop obviously, but you can get a few problems from time to time. This is onion thrips, uh, and you can see the bronzing on the leaves, the lower picture, even at the top. And if any of you have grown a lot of, especially the large sweet candy onions and some of those uh, larger onions, a lot of times you'll see these on those as well. Uh, and, and it's the same insect pest. Basically, it just scrapes off the chlorophyll out of the leaves and it causes bronzing, which can reduce your yield. Uh, to get rid of these, if it's a year that they're really, uh, then they might be really bad. You can use insecticidal soaps or you can use some labeled insecticides. Usually malathion or something like that will take these out. Um, and they're not, most years are not going to be a big enough problem to reduce your yield. Unless they're like that top picture and they're really bad, then you may need to go ahead and do some control issues. I know it's onion maggot. Um, this is, is um, uh, a little fly, a seed corn maggot, is it's actually a little fly. Same as the onion maggots, seed corn maggots, all those are the same little flies that actually will lay um, a, an egg at the base of the plant. That egg will hatch out and the little larva or maggot will burrow into your uh, bulb or your little plant there and it will eat uh, the inside of the plant out and cause it uh, to rot and die. Uh, the pressure is highest in early spring so if you see a bunch of these, you may want to pull them out, any stunted or yellowing plants and destroy them. Uh, and then don't plant garlic following onions or other alliums, which is just, you know, use good crop rotation to stop this. I've seen less of this as a problem in garlic because we're planting garlic in the spring. They're starting to grow. The onion maggot, usually when I see a problem with this is on onions, when you plant the, the onion plants in say March, it's cool and it's wet and you're planting the new plants out. That's whenever I've seen a lot of onion maggot pressure. Usually by the time these are up and actually growing and got some size on them, what our garlic's going to be by that point, onion maggots are not too bad. Another problem we can have is army worm. Um, the army worms usually will pick a plant or a group of plants and destroy them before moving on to other plants. That's why they call them army worms because they eat in uh, a large group and they kind of concentrate on a certain plant or a certain few plants. If you do have these, you can use labeled insecticides for army worms on garlic. Um, also, if a problem arises, you can use your uh, dye pail uh, if you want to do something organic, which just kills caterpillars, and these are uh, caterpillar. So uh, that's an easy fix for those. 
problem with army worms is a lot of times they'll come through so fast. And, you know, if you have been out in the garden in a week and uh, when it starts to warm up or in the garlic bed, they may eat a few plants before you get to them. But those are something just to keep in mind on. All right, wire worms. Uh, the larvae of the yellow and brown beetles uh, is, is uh, a wire worm. This one damages your roots and bulbs. They can also burrow into the garlic. Uh, it can also, these will also attack potatoes and some other cool season uh, root plants. Uh, this one is usually a problem if you plant it directly following sod. So let's say you went home today and you turned over uh, uh, some sod and you're gonna let it sit for a week or so and then you're gonna plant garlic into it. You have a much higher chance of having these wire worms damaging your garlic than if you would if this has been a, a, a flower bed or a vegetable bed for like the last three or four seasons. So just keep in mind, if you're gonna go plant directly after turning sod, you're gonna have a much higher chance of this. So I would recommend going ahead and planting in a spot that had been already uh, in production of something other than sod uh, to plant your garlic, uh, just to, to ward these uh, wire worms off. Some rot problems are probably gonna be a bigger problem for most of us than some of the insects are. This is white rot. It occurs in cool weather, generally early spring. It causes premature yellowing and drying of the older leaves, it causes stunting of the plant. You'll see tip burn on the leaves, and eventually the bulb will actually just rot. Uh, you can control this by crop rotation and then planting disease-free stock. So if you knew you had a bunch of this last year on your garlic, you probably don't want to save seed garlic off of your stock and plant back, and you wouldn't want to plant back in that same area. Maybe time to, to buy some new uh, 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 seed garlic and plant in that area. That way you can just uh, make sure you're not uh, perpetuating your same disease each year. We have fusarium rot. Uh, it's present in all of our soils. It's generally considered a secondary invader when plants are weakened or damaged by mechanical means or insects. I will tell you that my biggest uh, concern or biggest problem with these is when I didn't harvest my garlic soon enough. Uh, if you don't harvest it soon enough, if it sits in that wet soil, you have a lot of higher chance of that uh, skin on the outside of that garlic starting to break down, it gets wet, and then you have all these fusarium rots and those things that set in. Um, it's most active in high temperatures, which is also the higher temperature whenever we're in harvest. So we're usually harvesting around the 1st of July. So if you get your sets in wet, you didn't harvest soon enough, you get a lot more of this uh, uh, fusarium uh, rot in these plants. You can control this by crop rotation, remove infected plants. The number one thing I can tell you is to make sure you harvest uh, early and don't let them stay in the ground too long. That's, that's for me, the number one thing to, to ward this fusarium rot off. And then we have pink rot, and you can see those roots there are actually turning a pink tinge. Uh, it's another one of those primarily a warm weather fungus. It affects the roots, turns them pink, the root uh, die back, and then uh, die back occurs and then new roots form, which also become infected. And you can see the new roots there next to those uh, pink roots. Uh, and then above ground symptoms is gonna include tip burn. Uh, again, if you notice this, crop rotation again, if you've had this in your soil one year, you plant garlic there, you're just perpetuating that cycle over and over. So it's good to do crop rotation. We say that all the time, almost all of our uh, uh, vegetable crops, but that is key to limiting some of these uh, problems from year to year. And finally, we have Botrytis. Uh, it attacks your leaves following periods of warm, wet weather. It also can attack your bulbs and storage. Um, generally, uh, the symptoms include water-soaked stems. You can, this is an onion, but you get the idea of what those leaves are starting to do. They're water-soaked. Um, you also, severe infections can cause bulbs to rot. Mild infections, diseases may not be noticed, but uh, again, control by promoting air movement to promote drying. Um, these onions are planted quite thick, so they don't dry out as, as quickly as they should. We had wet weather, we we'll try to set in. Be the same way if you do garlic a little too close and uh, we had uh, wet weather set in and, and then it could just hit. So uh, basically, you wanna make sure you plant your space space your plants out properly, don't get them too, too thick, uh, and then uh, make sure that you get good proper air movement through these plants to stop this. Um, if you've noticed that you've had it multiple years, it may be time to maybe consider a different location and then play with your uh, plant spacing a bit. So harvest and curing. This is the way to ward off the fusarium rots. Is your timing when you harvest, you wanna harvest when the lower leaves 
start to turn yellow, about half the leaves should be green. A lot of people be like, oh, there's still a lot more growing time in that. It could be that's the best time to go ahead and harvest this. You'll get a nice big bulb. You'll ward off the fusarium rots. Uh, you'll get rid of any of those soil-borne problems that might set in if you were to leave them out there. Uh, you want to pull the plant, a few plants, and cut open the bulb. If the bulbs are, uh, it fills the skin, then they're ready. So might have to sacrifice a, a plant or two to make sure they're ready. But generally speaking, that's going to be the best thing you can do is harvesting these a little earlier than you might in your mind think that they should be harvested. Uh, waiting too long to harvest will cause the skins and the jackets uh, to come off the bulbs uh, of the bulbs. You can have the secondary invaders, all those problems can set in. So um, it's better to harvest a little bit early than a little bit late. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this is a little different scenario than we might do with some of our other uh, uh, vegetable crops. But this one's key for, the, for making sure that these are um, allowed to cure and then they'll, they'll store a lot longer if you harvest them a little early. So you want to harvest your bulk by digging and keep the roots attached. So just take your fork and just dig down the bed uh, and, and pop them all out of the ground. If the soil is dry or sandy, don't wash them. If it's wet uh, or sticking to them, you may rinse them off and then um, uh, put them in the, for drying. Generally speaking, I would prefer to dig these when the soil is dry, just not have to worry about that, that washing. But I know some years it may be so wet that we may need to dig these while they're wet. Not a problem, uh, but just make sure you don't let them stay wet very long. You want to allow the plants to dry in a well-ventilated area. Uh, that's a garage, a barn, um, even a, an open air shed. Something like that is always a good idea. You want to tie the plants in bundles of 10 or 15, or you can braid them depending on what you want to do with them. Most of the time uh, we do the hard necks here in Kentucky and we'll just bundle, you know, 10, 15 together, tie them up and just let them hang up in uh, the barn or a shed, uh, whatever you might have to hang these in. You wanna allow them to cure in a cool, dry place for three to four weeks until the plants turn completely brown. You could actually also dry these in, in a basement or something like that if you'd like. It'll take a little longer because the temperature's so much cooler in there. Usually for me, I prefer um, a barn or a shed or something like that that um, doesn't get real hot, but is warm in the daytime and cools at night. As far as storage goes, you can store your garlic, a hard neck or soft neck. Um, longer if they're kept at 60 to 70% relative humidity at 32 to 40 degrees. I know that's kind of hard for us to do as a homeowner, but a basement works well. Um, it, it's got the higher humidity and it won't be 40 degrees, but it may be 60, which will keep it, uh, or 65, 70. I don't know, whatever people will keep their basement set this time. But again, if you were to, if you had room, maybe you had another refrigerator or something, and you could store these in the crisper in the refrigerator, they're going to keep a long time. Uh, at room, te room temperature, usually the hard neck garlic uh, lasts about three to four months. Your soft neck's about six to eight. Um, usually a temperature between 42 and 52 are called sprouting, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then if your humi humidity is above 7%, that's going to cause it to root. So kind of want to keep that humidity down in that, uh, below that 70% and keep that temperature down if you can. If you can't, I know, uh, it, it, then pick one of the longer storing varieties. But for the most part, if you can keep that in the refrigerator or a cool dark spot, they're gonna keep uh, until you wanna plant some back. So um, I know that's run through pretty quick, but I'm trying to get it through in that hour. We're at 45 minutes, it looks like. Um, and we can open it up for questions. 